Ladies and gentlemen, the next session will begin in five minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The next session will begin in two minutes. Hello, bonjour, and ahoy. On Thursday evening, Globesec hosted the annual Czech and Slovak Transatlantic Award at the Bratislava Castle and presented the awards to the people of Ukraine and to Brigadier General Karol Zheka. In parallel, we hosted a networking cruise on the Danube on the Globesec boat. Here's what happened on day two. We started the day off with a keynote from the Director General of the World Health Organization, who warned about falling victim to complacency in the fight against COVID. Moving to the Indo-Pacific region, India's Minister of External Affairs elaborated on how Europe should look beyond its borders and problems and focus on a more collaborative efforts to solve global problems. Back in Europe, a troika of defense ministers from Slovakia, Bulgaria and Ukraine shared their views on the current military deliveries to Ukraine 
and outlined how the country can continue to defend itself in the face of ruthless Russian aggression. In Maria Theresia, icons of democracy from Estonia and Belarus brainstormed on how to counter the threat of autocracy and what ways we can build lasting societal trust in the digital age. Against the backdrop of global geopolitical instability, the ministers of defense from Greece and Sweden, as well as voices from the private sector and the think tank world, discussed Europe's future strategic autonomy. Shifting to the Globsec boat stage, the problematic topic of splinternet and its ramifications to obstructing interconnectedness was considered. Globsec's Danube Tech Valley initiative was launched, focusing on innovation potential in the region. A multitude of expert voices outlined how transatlantic partners can strengthen its cyber capabilities to counter threats and build cyber resilience. A major debate on the values of the Balkans took place in the Danube space, where voices from the region and Europe speculated on how the European way of life can triumph over anti-democratic forces. In the late afternoon, the Prime Minister of Slovakia and the Chancellor of Austria discussed the pressing issue of food security and solutions to overcome global supply chain issues. We still have so much more dynamic content to bring you from our international speakers and moderators. Don't be a stranger, follow us on social media and see you on day three. This is day three of the Globsec Forum 2022. Please welcome to the Danube stage, Andrew Muller. That is a long walk. Um, thank you all uh, for joining us here at this shocking hour uh, of a Saturday morning. The, the first big question is going to be the one about whose idea it was to try and get nine journalists out of bed at nine, five journalists out of bed at nine o'clock on a Saturday morning. Um, but yes, we, we have much to discuss uh, this morning. Uh, I'll introduce myself first. I'm Andrew Muller. I am the host of the Foreign Desk on Monocle 24. And as well as comparing panels here this weekend, we have all also been making not one, but in fact, it's turned out two editions of the program. So the first one will broadcast today live on Monocle 24 at midday and available for podcast after that. And part two will be available uh, next uh, Saturday. Um, so before we begin our discussion, uh, and I, I will, have we actually, we've already had the video, haven't we? We have had the video, in which case uh, I will just introduce the guests. They are Jessica Aro, Konstantin Egert, Olga Rudenko, and Lukasz uh, Ondachanin. Uh, we will be hearing more about their work very shortly. Okay, and before we start, there is in fact another video you can tell it's nine o'clock on a Saturday morning. Uh, before we begin, uh, it's, a, it's a short thing which has been made specially for Globesec by BBC Monitoring. The invasion of Ukraine has led to an upheaval in the country's media landscape as journalists deal with safety issues and censorship. While the Russian state has clamped down on independent media, both at home and in the territories it's occupying. More than 20 journalists have been killed in Ukraine since the war started. Russian troops are destroying media infrastructure. <coughs> in Russia, President Putin signed a censorship law that imposes jail terms of up to 15 years, but dissent hasn't disappeared entirely. Mm. Here's one of the journalists of state-controlled Channel One protesting on a live evening news show. <laughs> The Novaya Gazeta newspaper ceased publication shortly after the start of the war because its editors refused to call the invasion a special military operation. Many global news outlets have suspended their operations in the country. Foreign media in Russia will face more restrictions if a bill that's making its way through the Duma becomes law. In Russian-occupied territories in Ukraine, some media outlets resort to self-censorship. But not all regional outlets have taken the same step. A Kherson TV channel now broadcasts Russian propaganda Ukraine's pooled TV coverage, United News, has been praised as a rare example of unity among Ukrainian broadcasters. But critics say it is being used as an excuse to silence President Volodymyr Zelensky's opponents at home. Three TV channels that were critical of the president before the war were sidelined from contributing to United News and effectively taken off the air. All these changes and restrictions since the invasion reflect the need for a wider debate on how much Russia's crackdown will continue to intensify and whether Ukraine will return to a more pluralistic media environment after the war is over.
uh, that from BBC Monitoring. Uh, well, first of all, this morning, what I would like to do is get each of the panellists in turn to introduce themselves and uh, tell you a bit about their work. And do start bearing in mind that later in this discussion, uh, I will be soliciting questions from the floor and from anybody watching remotely who can file questions via this thing here on the desk in front of me. Um, so we'll start, I guess, from this side of the panel. Um, Jessica, tell us a bit about what you do. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm a Finnish journalist working with a Finnish broadcasting company. I specialize in Russia information warfare and extremism. I have been investigating the Russian trolls as well as uh, as well as their impact in real people ever since 2014 and uh, published a book about Russian trolls as well as the Russian security services slash Kremlin state propaganda machineries attacks against Western individuals uh, who have been uh, criticizing or even spreading factual information about uh, the Kremlin and its policies. And the book has been translated into uh, over 10 different languages. And I constantly train people to recognize and counter uh, Russian um, operations on social media, as well as try to lobby for better legislation to protect our citizens from these uh, intelligence service social media operations against us. Uh, Konstantin. Uh, I'm Konstantin Agat. So I, uh, I was born in Moscow 58 years ago, but the last eight years I live in Vilnius in Lithuania. Uh, my current uh, employer is DW Deutsche Welle, but essentially I'm a freelance journalist. Um, and uh, my career included working for different Russian media outlets, including newspapers and, um, and uh, heading uh, the BBC Russian service Moscow office for seven years uh, in actually in, in the first in the beginning of the century, and uh, most of what I do today is uh, analyzing Russia and uh, a bit of reporting from the Baltic states, but I'm afraid I'm very unexciting. I do anything dangerous or cutting edge in my life. <laughs> um, Lukas, you're here representing Slovakian media. Yeah, uh, thank you for having me. I'm a foreign news journalist working for Slovak Daily Zme, and I'm often covering this region, so our neighboring countries like Hungary, Poland, and uh, Ukraine as well. I was um, there a um, couple of times since the beginning of the war, and uh, I'm also focusing on the free speech and uh, media freedom, uh, which is a hot topic in uh, countries all around uh, Central Europe. Uh, and finally, Olga. Yes, hello. My name is Olga Rodenko. I'm a Ukrainian journalist. I'm the chief editor of the Kyiv Independent. We publish in English. We're based in Kyiv still. And uh, we have kind of an unusual origin story. We, are, we were founded only uh, six months ago when um, the very well-known English language newspaper in Ukraine, Kyiv Post, was shut down uh, for its, by its owner in an attempt to censor the newsroom. So the whole newsroom um, founded the Kiev Independent and when the war started we um, experienced a huge increase in followership and became, as many say, the primary news source um, on the war in Ukraine. Well, I, I want to start the discussion proper with you, Olga, because it, it has been an, an experience, I'm sure, unimaginable to most of us. You, you had what is turbulent enough uh, trying to start from scratch an entirely new news organisation, and then while you're in that difficult process, your country finds itself at war for its survival. W when was the point at which you realised that this is going to happen and we are now going to have to not only establish a new media organisation, but repurpose it to cover a, a national conflict? Mm -hmm. yeah, so we established the organization six months ago, meaning in November. So when the war, uh, not, not the war started because the war started in 2014, but when this full-scale invasion started in February, um, we were just three months old and, uh, you know, we were very, had a very ambitious goal as a media startup trying to make it in Ukraine. It's uh, in any environment is difficult, but in Ukraine especially. So we were busy with things like finding money and uh, you know establishing the um, the newsroom and preserving the team and so on. So um, we we didn't have one moment when we realized that the invasion is definitely happening because it was you know the the tensions were building up. Um, I think. I think probably two weeks 
uh, two weeks before the war, we realized that it is very likely, very, very likely that some escalation is happening. Um, all of us, including, including um, our defense reporters, uh, were inclining to think that the escalation will happen in the Donbas. Mm. So that, that Russia's goal will be to take the, the whole of Eastern Ukraine. Um, so we had, just 10 days before the war started, we had a, kind of the contingency plans meeting with the newsroom where we were discussing um, who's doing what, when, you know, if um, this escalation happens. And because people were talking about Kyiv maybe being targeted at some point, we, t we discussed that too, but it, we were discussing it as something that is very unlikely to happen. So we're talking about you know, whether we as journalists are safe to stay in Kyiv, if Russia is trying to invade it. But this, is, this discussion that happened 10 days before the war, was, it sounded really like, you know, like, yes, we need to talk about it just in case, but it's very unlikely that we will, it will ever happen. So um, we, we weren't sleeping when the war started, we, the, the night in the early hours of the 24th. <coughs> um, so we, we were watching, we watched uh, Vladimir Putin's uh, announcement um, of the, uh, the the declaration of war, um, and right from there we went into the into in, into the work mode, talking about who's doing what, who's who's going where now. For several days, people were evacuating because Kiev was targeted right away. The first um, we heard, we started hearing the explosions in the sky that were the first missiles raining down on Kiev minutes after Putin stopped speaking. So. Um, we were in a, in a very turbulent mode in the first days, but we also, um, there was not a single hour when we were not working, when the news weren't appearing on the website and on social media. And because of that, I guess, and uh, uh, because we are the, the best known, I think, local news source in English. Now, um, we experienced an explosion in fellowship and it was something that was very, weird to, to realize because if it happened in the, in the peaceful time, we would be celebrating it. But as it was happening during the war, we were kind of, you know, we were just running and working and, you know, at some point somebody would say in, the, in, in our newsroom chat, like, like, guys, did you see our Twitter is hitting one million? Um, and it was 30,000 before the war. Um, and we were like, oh, okay, okay, and, and just keep working. So it, it's, a, it's a very surreal feeling. Uh, it, it has done incredible work, though, the Kiev Independent, and I think for a lot of us it's been the best means, certainly in English, of, of understanding what is going on in Kiev. But, Konstantin, I wanted to bring you in at this point with your experience and understanding of, of Russia. Is there any equivalent now that you know of that enables the, the interested consumer of the media to actually understand what is going on like genuinely for real going on in Russia? Or is now the Russian government, the Russian regime completely detached from any sort of independent scrutiny at all? Well, thanks for asking. I think that uh, the answer to this question is actually, um, well, I mean, quite sad and paradoxical. Um, with all due respect and, and deep love for colleagues with a lot of them I've worked. I worked for some for two years for TV Dosh, TV Rain, which has been um, now banned and essentially relocated to Riga. With all due respect to Novaya Gazeta and the rest of them, uh, the problem for the the problem is not access to independent information in Russia. Um, it is more of a problem today, but until the well, let's say last year, you could watch TV Dosh, you could subscribe and watch it, you could go online and read Nova Gazeta, you could listen to, I don't know, Echo Moskvi, for example. Um, the problem is not access. It will be more of a problem now that you have uh, Putin blocking VPNs and, and, and uh, essentially really imposing technological limits. Um, the problem is the Russian society. Uh, when you hear about um, support, Putin is supported by I know 80% of this war supported by 60%. Um, well, I think that there is a problem here. It's not, I think the minority of these people do support Putin in the proper sense. They, they, they think that Putin is doing the right thing. But the majority of this kind of quote-unquote support base 
are actually people who choose to pretend that they support. The problem of Russian society is not access to independent media. The problem of society is that the society doesn't want to know. Because before you know, you have to want to know. And this is a huge challenge for, uh, well, for us still kind of trying to knock on the door uh, of Russian society. Um, and it's a very long haul thing. Because what it was essentially um, what happened uh, in Russia, well, at least during the Putin period, and especially in the last 10 years, was relentless 24-7 brainwashing, uh, which essentially focused on a very simple thing. Um, there are no values. There is no democracy. Democracy is just a tool of the elites to, uh, to, to, to achieve their aims, which are usually very, very mercantile, if you wish. Um, all conflicts are always about interests, uh, and essentially, and that's very important, uh, you, the Russians, you are not at all responsible for anything. Anything bad that happens to you is not your fault. It's the Americans, it's the CIA, Mossad, global Zionism, man, little green man from the UFO, anything. Traitor Gorbachev, alcoholic Yeltsin, you have nothing to be blamed for, and we are going to fix it. And for a society which is essentially very isolated from the world, Russia has uh, a smaller percentage-wise, a smaller number of people that have passports than the Americans, at whom we always laugh about that. Um, it is a very, very little travel society. It is a society which, as a result of these 30 years, 20 years at least, has become extremely individualistic and at the same time extremely unsure of itself and powerless. And Putin used it, and basically what I think, he, he depth charged Russia. Um, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, I'm, saying it's, I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm saying that I will not be surprised if the country just implodes at a certain moment in time. Uh, because I think the biggest problem is the horrible, absolutely horrible state of the Russian society. And uh, last thing I want to say is that what you've seen in Bucha, in Irpen, in, in Gostomel, and, and all these kind of war crimes, um, they were committed, yes, by whatever, a few thousand people out of 140 million or whatever, uh, how many live in Russia today. Uh, but alas, to my mind, uh, this is a symbol of a certain and significant segment of the Russian society. These people do not exist in a vacuum. They exist in certain social, economic, and psychological circumstances that led them to commit these crimes. And this is a very big challenge. I think that uh, what happened there told us a lot of very, very unpalatable and unpleasant truths uh, about the Russian society. So my, my answer is that, yes, one has to continue, one has to, to try and sort of break through this wall, but you have to remember it's very, very, very difficult, and you're dealing with an extremely traumatized and um, kind of, if you wish, bent out of shape society. It, it does feel like what we've witnessed in Ukraine over the last three months has been a kind of culmination of something that has been building in Russia for many, many years. And it occurs that we obviously saw the military build up for many, many months along Ukraine's borders. But there was, Jessica, I'll ask you this in particular because you learned all about this the hard way, that there was a years-long build up of a kind of strange Russian offensive media capability as well. And so I'm, I'm going to ask you to talk a bit about what you were able to find out when you started looking into Russia's uses of it's not even information where Russia's concerned or even disinformation or misinformation. A lot of it is this just strange, surreal nonsense that they like to flood um, the media space with. But you looked into it and then found yourself on the receiving end of it. You were a target of it. Correct, yes. And uh, it all started for me in 2014. As a journalist, I was really heavily trying to 
cover what was happening with Russia attacking Ukraine already at that time. But it was so difficult because there was so much propaganda, so much disinformation. Uh, those uh, little green men, no one really knew who they were. No one was able to say that they were actually Russian uh, military officers. In fact, they were called separatists. So the blame was being already put at the wrong place at that time. So it was also confusing. And at the same time, I found out that really super brave Russian independent journalists had already back in 2013 uncovered the so-called troll factory in St. Petersburg and infiltrated to work there. And what they had found out was so disturbing. They found out that this factory actually uh, employed youngsters who were then updating and building fake profiles, anonymous profiles on social media, pushing uh, for example, uh, smear messages against uh, Russian opposition politicians, as well as promoting Putin's policies. So I realized that something new is now going on in the information space, and I started to look into it and investigate the Russian troll narratives, the stories that they were pushing already back then internationally, and it was um, a crowdsource investigation, meaning that Finnish internet users were helping me to investigate. And uh, as I looked into it, uh, I found out that those Russian trolls were already back then smearing Ukrainians, Ukrainian leadership. Uh, they were rolling the blame uh, against the Kyiv uh, military junta who has uh, taken power and uh, blaming that Ukrainian leaders are fascists and Nazis and that uh, it was Ukraine who shut down MH17, and it was the European Union and NATO who, uh, in fact, started the war against Ukraine, and that Russia didn't step their foot in uh, Ukrainian soil. This was back in 2014 and 2015, happening in the international uh, information space, also in Russian language, with memes, with the use of videos, as well as Twitter and Facebook uh, bots and trolls. And unfortunately, as I looked also, how has these narratives impacted real people? Because that has been always in the core of my investigations. Uh, I found out that some people, they told me that they didn't know what was true anymore. Especially they mentioned the situation in Ukraine back in eight years ago, uh, because they told that there is so much troll disinformation and information uh, online that it's difficult to tell what is actually happening. And right there, also one Russian information warfare objective and mission accomplished. When people say they don't know or they don't trust the information that is presented in the media, uh, the trolls have already won. Also what I witnessed, so on my opinion, the most disturbing effect was that some real people started to spread this troll propaganda further. Some real people were being brainwashed uh, and then basically turned into Putinist zombies, uh, uh, even in Finland, who you would think maybe w wouldn't fall so easily, but would fall and then they would start brainwashing their communities, just like Russian trolls. So that's what, what was happening already eight years ago. So Russians were already back then so carefully, so uh, they had a detailed plan. Uh, to start manipulating the international community uh, to actually um, somehow accept this warfare, somehow to lose sight of what is actually happening, who is to blame, is it a civil war or what is it? So it was really nice to see that, that in action. And in, uh, as, as you were mentioning, I have been in the receiving end. As soon as I started to look into this topic, uh, in a couple of days, I was being made the target of a criminal campaign with aggravated crimes, stalking, aggravated uh, libel, uh, starting from Russia, from Russian uh, Institute of uh, Strategic Studies, uh, which includes Russian intelligence service officers appointed by Putin himself. And that then prolonged and uh, continued in Finnish pro-Kremlin fake news sites called, for example, What the Fuck Paper, very popular amongst uh, some Finnish readers. Uh, altogether, 300 fake news stories have been published about me, claiming that I'm a NATO drug dealer, I'm a NATO troll, I'm CIA helper, 
I am criminal, mentally ill, and I invented Russian trolls in my own imagination. And this, when I started to look into this and tell publicly about my what was happening to me, uh, even my own friends started hating me, some of them. According to the Finnish police, I uh, faced the threat of impulsive violence if I was in the wrong place in the wrong time. So people were mobilized by Russian trolls and their helpers in Finland uh, to really go after me, to stalk me. So as I started to look into this, it was a pattern. So this was happening internationally. So many people have become targets to this, who have tried to tell the truth about what Russia is doing in Ukraine, who shot down MH17, for example, Bellingcat in the UK. They have been made target. Um, a Serbian think tanker has been made target. A Swedish researcher who back in 2017 told that uh, how Russia is attacking their society militarily, diplomatically on social media and using media. Uh, he became attacked. So Russia has this international plan of just silencing everyone who wants to tell the truth about Ukraine. Uh, Luke, I should bring you in. Um, I'm interested in what influence you've seen beyond Russia and Ukraine of this corruption of the media discourse by Russia. You've reported, of course, extensively from across Eastern Europe. You were making us all jealous before we came out here with uh, stories of reporting from Central Asia as well. Has this thing acquired a momentum beyond Russia, this idea of we do need another word for it that isn't misinformation or disinformation because it's not really either of those things, I don't think. It is just sort of this strange, surreal static. Do you see evidence of it across the region more broadly? Well, definitely as yes. and uh, we could see it in the beginning of the war. Like first days, I was, let's say, pleasantly surprised that there are not so many fake news because all these trolls or even supporters of Vladimir Putin, they were not sure what to say, maybe what to do about this war. But uh, after maybe one week, uh, you already seen different discourses. And that is probably the m biggest aim of all these trolls, uh, just to spread some kind of chaos. It doesn't need to be true, doesn't need to be false or hoax. Uh, the, the aim is to make chaos so you are not sure what is true and uh, what to believe and uh, how to behave, what, what to think. So, so definitely um, you could see it also in a Slovak discourse on uh, social media, which are not helping much and uh, probably there will be globsec trends uh, results uh, presented today uh, but uh, i was uh, quite shocked that uh, nearly like half of slovak population believe the most common conspiracy theories and uh, just overall i think 30 percent uh, trust traditional media in slovakia and uh, these are probably the worst results from the whole region so you could see how big the influence of social media is and then other thing is not uh, just media, but uh, politicians who are not giving, let's say, clear statements. So they don't need to work for Russia. They don't need to be paid by Russia. And definitely there are some of them uh, here as well. Uh, but uh, some of them would say, oh, but we are not sure who is responsible uh, for the war in Ukraine. And uh, also the results are s showing that uh, like one fourth of Slovaks believe that the West is somehow responsible for the war in Ukraine. So you could see how big influence it has if people are hesitant, if there are no clear messages and um, if there is a, like informational chaos uh, online, um, on social media mostly. Uh, Constantin, just to bring you back in, it, it, this, I, I guess, echoes back the point you were making earlier. And as, 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 as Lukas is saying, it's clearly a lot of this stuff is, is believed to an extent by a great many people. And is this the eternal problem that the media, at least vaguely responsible independent media, always runs up against, that ultimately people are going to believe whatever it is that they want to believe? Yes, I think there is a big problem. And I think that in the age of social media, uh, where basically you can choose uh, what to hear, listen and view, and this choice of yours will definitely conform to your prejudices, your political views, your attitudes. So essentially, you, the whole idea is that you, 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 you live in an echo chamber in which essentially you, don't, you never hear any other opinion because you don't want to. And you can afford not to. In the age of you know classic, uh, classic media, uh, let's say public service broadcasting. Well, I worked for the BBC for ten years, uh, and there you have to have a different points of view. And essentially, if you 
uh, if you uh, if you are a consumer of let's say BBC News, again, it has its problems, but generally you will hear other points of view. Well, you can avoid it now. It's not a problem. And also, I think what's important, and this is something that uh, feeds into what uh, Lukar said. Um, I think that what the not only the Russians but the Chinese and the Iranians are doing, essentially, they are uh, selling two things, to my mind. Um, psychologically speaking, they are selling cynicism and uh, a victim complex. Um, so nothing is true. We can't believe anyone. I heard it look in Lithuania, which is a frontline state, which is very much sort of supportive of Ukraine. Um, I heard it, well, let's say before this stage of the war, from Lithuanians. Um, yeah, what is the difference between Putin and, let us say, the former president Grybauskaitė? Well, they're all on the take, they're all politicians, they're all the same. So I think that that is um, an important uh, element. And uh, again, to my mind, uh, politically speaking, in Europe, what's being sold massively and quite successfully, especially to the, uh, to the elites, for lack of a better word. It is very simple. It's anti-Americanism. And in this respect, you have a horseshoe effect in which, if you look at the uh, sort of uh, the further part of the right, uh, sort of right side of the spectrum and the left side of the spectrum, um, suddenly you find out that their views, let's say, of, of Putin's assault in Ukraine are pretty much similar for different reasons. But, and the same goes for America. Uh, if you, I don't know, read the New Republic or the Jacobin and then you listen to Tucker Carlson, suddenly you realize that basically there is no difference. Uh, and the, the reasons why they are uh, adopting these positions are different. But Putin is an equal, or oh, the Iranians or the Chinese, they're equal opportunity employers. They, 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 they will work with the left and with the right, it doesn't matter. Uh, as long as, um, as long as it sells. And I think that this undermining, uh, undermining this belief in the existence of the collective West, which is, let's face it, which is pinned upon the United States. That is what's being targeted 24 seven at the uh, opinion makers, at politicians and so on and so forth. And when you lay a layer of cowardice and corruption on top of it, as is in, let, let me be very frank, in Germany, in Italy, in France especially, um, then you get a result. It's a very toxic sandwich. Uh, I'm going to start bringing in questions from the floor and from the screen very shortly. But before I do that, one more question I wanted to put to you, Olga, which is about what <coughs> conversations you and your colleagues have had about the role your organization now plays. Do you... Have you started to think of yourself as, you know, having some obligation to national morale as part of your country's struggle? Have you talked about what you would do if stories cropped up, as they will in any conflict which reflect poorly on your government or your military? Uh, how confident are you that you would be able to maintain complete independence? That's a great question. Thank you. Um, well, well, first of all, there is not... To, to be completely honest, there is not much space right now to have discussions among the staff about things like that. Um, we, we, I mean, the, the regime that we are working in since February, you mentioned earlier that it's a bad idea that you get journals out of bed on Saturday. <laughs> um, that's how I learned it was Saturday. Uh, so, so we don't really have the concept of days of the week anymore. Um, so there was not, no, not enough space, I guess, for us, the capacity to have discussions like that. But this is something I personally have been thinking about quite a lot because, um, well, we are in the, um, Ukrainian journalists are in a very special, very unusual, I think, relationship with the Ukrainian government right now, because before the war, we and other journalists were often critical of the government, deservedly so, um, as we should be. But because when, when, the, when the invasion started, we jumped into this survival mode, like all of us, and we realized very quickly, like the world learned after Bucha, but we knew because, you know, we're on the ground, we know Russia well, so we knew that this is the war to end the existence of Ukraine. Um, so we were in, and we are in a survival mode, and it means being, I don't like saying on, on one side with the government, but we are, you know, we, we definitely have a joint 
fight here. So um, in the beginning, automatically, it meant that you know we are not doing critical stories about about just exactly how Volodymyr Zelensky, for example, is um, you know taking decisions in this moment, for example, um, about the war. So now the feeling in Ukraine is that the space is beginning to open for actually um, asking hard questions from the government, from the authorities about the war and about how it has been fought and about the preparations that were done or not done before the war. But this is only, only starting. Now it's, uh, it's a debate that is going on on social media, but it's beginning to spill, spill out in the in traditional media. Um, I'm really concerned about what kind of, um, the, what, what the state of the freedom of speech will be in Ukraine after, um, well, you would say after the war ends, we in Ukraine prefer to say after the victory. Um, so I'm, I'm really concerned about that because the, um, I mean, we, we, we saw what kind of, how, how President Volodymyr Zelensky is praised internationally for his brave decision to stay in Kyiv and for the way he's lead, leading the nation now. And um, while a lot of that is deserved, I also can't not think as a journalist about how that, how living for months and months um, in this state of uh, utmost praise coming to coming to you, you know, uh, from uh, from the journals all over the world and from the international community, how it's going to change the the attitude that he has to to uh, media, which was not great even before the war. He was having some very you know uh, tough relationships with the with certain journalists. He was pretty irritated by any criticisms coming from the media, uh, and it was a known fact. So you take that and you put this person through several months, or I don't know how many more months, um, of being praised 24-7 and not being criticized, not being held responsible for anything. So um, I'm, I'm very concerned about where we we'll land after this ends, because the, the essence of the war for us is to not become Russia. It's as simple as that, not become Russia in terms of values, not what just this is. Russia represents everything we don't want to be. And one of the things that made Russia possible is the absence of freedom of speech. So if, we, if uh, the freedom of speech in Ukraine suffers, and was not great before the war even, mm -hmm. but if it becomes even worse after the war, then um, it's, uh, it's something that's very concerning to me. Okay, I'm going to start bringing in questions from elsewhere. I'll come to the audience shortly. I have a question here on the screen from uh, Heinrich Kreft. Uh, thank you for this, Heinrich, which I, I will put to you, uh, Lukash. And he's asking, and it, it goes a bit to what you were saying earlier about the self-perpetuating nature of conspiracy theories. And the trouble is when, of course, you try to push back against them, you are by definition part of the conspiracy. Um, but Heinrich Kreft is asking, do we need more funds for Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty and the like in order to counter the fake news narrative of Putin and others? Or do we just once again run up against people believing what they prefer to believe? Well, I think um, if the basic journalistic values are relevant uh, in this media, uh, I think, yeah, we, we need to somehow, somehow fight against the fake news. I'm not saying we should create some fake news because there are some, somebody who would probably say that we should praise, as, as Olga said, uh, one of the parties praising uh, President Zelensky or creating these narratives of Ghost of Kiev, which I understand from the point of Ukraine and uh, Ukrainian society, but uh, yeah, journalists should be very careful to maybe not be part of it, to you know just mm, bring too much praise. Uh, but uh, if the basic values and um, journalistic standards are mm, observed, I think it's okay to give more funds uh, to the relevant media who are able to bring uh, news maybe not just to um, Ukrainians, to people in Europe or, or in Russia. I think it's a um, good way how to counter this propaganda. And I don't see it as counter propaganda because, uh, yeah, if the values are um, observed, it should be fine. <laughs> Okay, I did see some hands up. Uh, that I, you, sir, if you could uh, stand and introduce yourself briefly, someone will come around with a microphone and then uh, put your question to the panel. Thank you very much. My name is Andrei Matyshaga. I'm a journalist here from Slovakia for, for Daily Pravda. Uh, 
uh, great panel, uh, uh, and thank you for your job. There is also an, your job is also an inspiration for, for, for me, so thank you very much. But if I may be a bit more specific, uh, uh, Olga, you said something uh, mm, I think very important that uh, we might be, that I understand that might be some concerns uh, that after the victory, as you said, that uh, what this horrible war will basically how it will affect Ukraine, how it will affect media, freedom of speech. Uh, so maybe, uh, I know this is probably not the easiest thing, but, uh, and Lukas, uh, Lukas also said a few things about it, but what maybe would be your advice for us, for, for journalists from abroad, how to, <sighs> it was a very interesting point you mentioned with Zelensky, because really being in the, I, I, it's hard to imagine in his psychological state. But, uh, uh, and I want to praise him, but yeah, this you mentioned something uh, very important. So how we should maybe uh, cover Ukraine now. Uh, also, also, also basically uh, thinking about it that this is, yeah, the conflict is very wide and black, definitely. Russia is to blame, period. But maybe if you can give us some advice how to do it, what to focus on, not to just basically uh, repeating what Russian, uh, what Ukrainian government is saying, which is okay on one hand, but on the other hand, we are journalists. We simply have to look at the critically at at at, at the things. Uh, so maybe if you have advice for us a bit, if I if I may ask, and if I may uh, address this panel is, it says that the title of the panel panel is journalists and media in crisis. Do you feel? Do you feel that? That we are in well, crisis when, and what when, it when do journalists not feel that the media is in crisis? <laughs> uh, but, but Olga, if, if you were to make any gentle suggestions to foreign reporters trying to make sense of what's happening in Ukraine and how to communicate <laughs> it to their readers or listeners, what would you mm -hmm. tell them? So, so first of all, I just have to say that most um, international journalists covering Ukraine, including on the ground, I think are doing a very good job. And uh, especially they were very important in the beginning of the invasion when, you know, there were news organizations that had the resources and funds um, and experience that allowed them to send the TV crews to, you know, places where Ukrainian journalists couldn't yet go because when the invasion started, a lot of us didn't even have the basic, uh, you know, protective gear for our reporters. So, so in general, um, international journalists are doing a good job in Ukraine, but mistakes do happen frequently, including in the, in, you know, in New York Times, for example. Um, I think, I think there is, um, um, if I if I could give one advice, I think it's try to try to cooperate with local journalists more, because there is um, a lot of journalists who are covering Ukraine now. They either do it from abroad, never been to, never having been to Ukraine, um, or they come to Ukraine but it's their first time, and they you know the the drill is they hire a local speaker, a local uh, fixer for them, and uh, there is an editor somewhere in, in New York or London who uh, demands five stories from the trip, or not five stories, but I'm exaggerating, but whatever, there is a lot of pressure. So, you know, in that, in that environment, um, mistakes are being made. So if there's, at the same time, there are so many local journalists on the ground who, who have the knowledge of context, who know the, the background of these people who are, who are the you know Ukraine's voices uh, in the world now? Because you know there is there is, for example, like a certain politician who became like you know um, who's always say on CNN, for example, commenting on something, um, and and maybe before um, interviewing this person and before uh, you know taking everything he or she says. Um, as, as a truth, you want to try to learn some background and local context about about what's you know what's the back background of the person. Um, have they been lying all the time in the past uh, seven years before you learned of their existence because of the war? You know, it's it's local journalists who can answer that for you. Uh, so if there is, I, I just keep thinking that it's such a waste that there is not closer cooperation between between the international media and local journalists in Ukraine. And um, as you mentioned, uh, the, the part about praising or criticizing um, Ukrainian authorities, like President Volodymyr Zelensky, I think that you 
as an international, as, as, a, as a journalist not in Ukraine, you have more freedom to do that. And, uh, um, you know, you, it is, it is of course, you know, it, it, it's dangerous in the way that you, if you're doing it from abroad, not seeing what's happening in Ukraine, you're risking falling, you know, for some, for example, Rus Russian narratives. Um, propaganda narratives that they're trying to instill. So you have to be careful, but at the same time, you have more freedom to do it. You have more freedom to ask questions than, than we do, because, I mean, we have to be um, extremely, you know... Um, legal, legal constraints, well, um, it's true that they've tried to, in Ukraine, they've tried to limit the, the freedom of the press on the, on the legal level in the sense of um, it's, it's officially, I think, forbidden to, uh, to report about the, um, the sites where missiles hit, for example, for some for, for days after the attack or something, um, and, and some, some other limitations like the names of the victims, you can't publish them, but everybody does. So uh, it's, a, it's a somewhat unjustified um, limitation, which is a problem again, because nobody really explains like, whether, whether this is like, really justified. There is no, like, people from the military don't come out and tell journalists like, we are forbidding this because. Um, so, and everybody's asking questions like, can, can Russia really, you know, because we are being told you can't, you can't like, broadcast anything about where this missile hit because, you know, the people who are sending missiles from Russia are going to use that information and just, you know, send the second one, but, but target it better. And people are very, you know, um, doubtful about whether this is, hap this is possible to do it in real time like that, but nobody is explaining that to us. Um, so answering to your question, you, I, I, I think you should be asking questions. I, should, I think you, should, you have more liberty to be, to be asking tough questions than we do. We will, we are getting there too, but it is, um, we have to be very cautious because we're in Ukraine, but you have more liberty to do it and you should use it. Uh, Jessica, you had something you wanted to add. Yes, I would like to add to what you asked about media and journalism being in crisis. Yes, unfortunately, this is always <coughs> been a super uh, dangerous and difficult profession. And I believe many journalists know it when they start the trade, uh, that if they go to certain areas, to conflict areas, uh, there are hazards. Uh, unlike in many other professions. But uh, unfortunately, in the modern days, we are seeing uh, worsening of the situation also in the information space. This is also uh, true and can be found in World Press Freedom Indexes uh, compiled by um, reporters without borders annually. And what they are seeing and, and finding every year, uh, the uh, dangers against journalism and journalists are becoming worse and worse. Also in those countries which traditionally have been very press free, such as United States, especially during Trump's era, uh, the situation became uh, more and more dangerous and uh, United States was seen fall uh, a lot behind in this index. So, and for example, in Finland, which is amongst the safest and happiest countries in the world, uh, we have witnessed this kind of atmosphere that is never seen before. And the atmosphere is created by pro-Kremlin, uh, pro-far-right uh, activists, propaganda architects using social media, such as YouTube, live streaming, super chat and chat features, uh, event features of Facebook where there are protests against journalists as well as newsrooms being organized. Uh, we have witnessed um, people who have been agitated by pro-Kremlin propagandists in Finland, uh, basically pushing, uh, using mental violence uh, in real life against journalists. And you should really see these in disinformation campaigns, these criminal libelous campaigns that are specifically directed at journalists who are covering, uh, for example, Russia, uh, far right, uh, and other uh, topics. So. This is happening everywhere. So many people are thinking, is it, is it worth it? Is it worth, am I willing to accept this criminal activity as part of 
uh, my work anymore. And especially it's a, a difficult uh, task for the employers of journalists because they have to pay the bill also. They have to, because if a journalist becomes targeted for crimes for their work, then it's the employer's responsibility. And I'm not sure if the media houses are carrying that responsibility very well. Uh, there were one or two other hands I saw. Yes, uh, up the back. Uh, if we could get a microphone there. And if you could just uh, stand and introduce yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Laura, um, and I'm helping out here at the event. Um, I just wanted to ask that there are obviously um, trolls and that are just helping with Russian pro propaganda, but also I feel like even in the intellectual sphere, uh, people are dressing, like really trying to be critical towards the West. And I think in the times of, of war, it's quite, to me, sometimes it's even inappropriate, those criticisms. And I feel like um, it creates a situation where obvious facts are being questioned, um, even from uh, like, uh, days before the war, I was sitting with my colleagues from the university who, and they were really critical towards NATO and uh, they were questioning everything. And I feel like um, this can also contribute to, um, to the propaganda of the evil, even among more, um, let's say, intellectual circles. Um, and I see this also reading some academic articles, etc. And I understand it's very important to be critical, but I feel like it's in the times of war, especially it's sometimes not appropriate. Um, and I think it also relates to the question in the screen, uh, what should I tell my parents who don't know what news to believe anymore? And, I've, and the truth is sort of distorted. And um, it, it is for me sometimes hard as well to stand up for the truth and to respond to those people uh, that say everything is relative. Um, uh, one for you, perhaps, Lukash, given what you were talking about earlier, about the, the ripple effects created by Russia's media. Yeah, uh, well, I think, it's, I think it's okay to be critical to the West and NATO if it's justified, and if it's not just a platform to gain your fans, because we've seen it, we are seeing it in Slovak Facebook, there are politicians and analysts who would probably just criticize the West just because they see it's popular and they are getting more v votes or, uh, yeah, they are getting into parliament just because they are critical of the West. So I think it's okay to be um, critical. I don't think during the war we shouldn't be critical uh, if it's not justified. Uh, but uh, yeah, of course, if there's this kind of whataboutism when you say that, oh, uh, but you were not critical of uh, invasion in Iraq or uh, similar with Kosovo, uh, I think that's that's like pointless way to, of discussion. But uh, but uh, in general, um, the important thing is that politicians and uh, um, public figures are not misusing this whole discussion for their own profit. Because this is what I think we see in Slovak internet that people are um, just trying to be popular with, uh, let's say, popular opinions because they see that it's fine to be critical towards the EU and, uh, and to hate the US and the NATO and uh, it brings them votes and popularity. So uh, that's it. <laughs> uh, okay, there's a question from the, the screen I want to bring in and it, it is something we touched upon earlier and I am wondering if there's been any formal or informal pressure on the key of independent in this direction. This is a question asking, do you agree that in times of war we need propaganda to lift spirits, promote good things, even if they might not be totally true? And it's, be, it's been interesting watching this from outside and there's been a couple of examples um, in, in your country's conflict. The, the legend of the ghost of Kiev, the, the, the mythical fighter pilot, which got floated very early. And then actually I kind of thought to their credit the Ukrainian Ministry of Defense sort of walked back from when people tried to identify the actual pilot uh, and they did issue a statement saying information hygiene in time of war is actually quite important do please check your sources but but do things like a, a myth like the ghost of Kiev or or the defenders of Snake Island which seemed too good to be true and then turned out actually kind of was um, 
what do you do with stories like that? Do you amplify them or, or, or do you exercise the kind of skepticism you would if you, you heard about them from anywhere else? Um, thank you. So if you look at the Kiev independent coverage, you're not going to find anything about the ghost of Kiev there. <laughs> Um, and that's because we, we, we realized from the beginning that it is 99 percent, you know, a, a kind of like a good propaganda myth to to make people people, people feel good. Uh, just like you're not going to find a, a report that was very popular in, I think, in March about a woman in Kiev who allegedly shot down a Russian drone with a jar of pickles. Um, we we will. Look, you know, in the time of war, you can't verify everything you're reporting. You, you, when the government says something ha is happening on the battlefield, you can't immediately go and check and see with your own eyes whether it is true. What you can do, though, if you can be very, very responsible, very careful about the sources of information. Um, you, you look at where the reports like the, the Jar of Pickles came from. Um, and the Charles Pickles report came from a Twitter account of a Ukrainian uh, woman who, um, not sure about now, but until recently was the head of an a anti-disinformation center in the Ukrainian government. She, she's directly affiliated with the government. And it had no, um, it, there was no like, you know, this is a woman I know, or this is like I read it there. It's just, it's just a Twitter, just a tweet with no absolutely source anywhere. So, of course, it was shared, it became kind of a, a legend, um, just like the ghost of Kiev. With the ghost of Kiev, I think they went too far because they found uh, one pilot, and we we know who who the pilot is, even though he was not identified uh, publicly. He was like given interest on CNN, wearing the the, the pilot's uh, mask, uh, um, and presented as the, uh, I don't remember if they if they presented him as the ghost of Kiev, but it was clear that this is this is the the legendary pilot. Um, and we, we, we know actually who the, the pilot is. So we, because we, again, as I mentioned earlier, because we know the context and the background often, we don't, we know when to not amplify. And I think we know when to not, not amplify better than the international media, um, which is why, you know, there is no story about the ghost of Kyiv and the Kyiv independent. I personally understand, I saw the effect of the stories on my friends, both in journalism and not. And it was definitely very um, spirit lifting. At the same time, though, there were many stories from the first days of, the, of this invasion that were true and were just as powerful. To me, the most powerful things were not you know, the ghost of Kiev or the, uh, the, the brave woman who shot down Russian drone with a, pickle, pick, with a jar of pickles. To me, the, the most important things were the actual real videos of regular Ukrainians trying to stop Russian tanks with bare hands that, that are coming to their villages, or a Ukrainian woman in, the, in northern Ukraine who is um, shooting a video of her conversation with a Russian soldier, and she's, she's almost attacking him. She's like, she, she's saying, she's asking, why, why have you come, what, what are you doing in this my land? Who are you? What are you doing here? She's been very aggressive and very brave asking these questions and shooting like a, like a live video of herself doing that. So that is, I think that is more inspiring than, than the legend of, uh, of, uh, of the ghost of Kiev. And uh, so, so yes, and the, actually the more, I think the more, um, the, the, the bigger, bigger example of that, but that may not be well known in the West, but it's well known in Ukraine, is, for example, the existence of the, the phenomenon of uh, um, a very popular commentator called uh, Alexei Aristovich, who is um, producing, he's, he's an advisor to Zelensky administration. He's producing daily videos with his commentary on the war. And the commentary is meant to be very, pacifying, very optimistic, um, you know, like the war's going to end in two weeks and so on. Um, and people love it, people love him. Um, now I think is the time when people start questioning whether whether he should be believed actually, because because he's his advisor to the president's administration, it is being understood that he has access to more information than all of us do. And when he's saying like this very optimistic things, then you're inclined to believe it. And yes, psychologically, it was helping people. I don't have, you know, 
I'm not exactly sure whether it was appropriate to do that, whether it was appropriate on the administration's behalf to, to have that. At the same time, I can't not think about um, people maybe using this as actionable information. So we, you know, we will never know how many people, if any, um, watched this watched these videos or um, you know uh, reacted to some this positive legends that the Ukrainian government were um, allegedly putting out there to create a more free, like to, to, to live the spirits. So how many people were looking at that and thinking that, yes, it looks like we're going we're gonna to push Russia out of Ukraine in several days or something like that. And how many people believed that and decided, for example, not to evacuate and ended up in Bucha, you know, like, so, so there, is no, there is no way of knowing how harmful this information was. Um, Constantine, I, I noticed yes, you had your I, hand I up there. If you could sort of back, because was, we start talking about, you know, professional issues um, in the last sort of <laughs> in the half that we have left. Um, I wanted to walk back a little bit to what uh, our colleague from uh, Globsec team uh, asked us about uh, NATO and, uh, and, uh, and um, being critical. Um, of course, it's normal to be critical. Um, the issue is, and I think there are several issues we are facing um, on a broad scale, which will be with us for decades to come. First and foremost, as professionals, we're against a very stiff competition. We're actually losing our profession, and it's natural, because if anyone can broadcast stuff from their iPhone, we, as formerly exclusive holders of a certain professional qualification, we are in danger. And that's going to be it. We'll have to use and learn new skills, and we'll have to live in a much more uh, challenging environment. That's number one. Number two, um, about criticism. I think that criticism is right, uh, but we will have, because of Russia, because of China, because of Iran, we'll have to basically define again what the West is and what holds us together. It's post-Cold -post War, and this, this understanding what do we exactly mean when we talk about the West? Uh, that is a debate uh, that will continue and will be very, very pertinent uh, in, in the decades to come. And I think number three, um, there is an issue, and you mentioned um, the United States, there is an issue of defining freedom of speech. I think that Europe is actually, well, compared to the United States, let's, let's face it, Europe is much less free in terms of speech than the United States. And I think that this feeds into a lot of stuff here on the continent, because with all the limitations that we have, justified as they are, uh, people start saying, well, these elites are actually uh, trying to, put a, uh, uh, to, to muzzle us. And they go for conspiracists, and now it's very easy uh, to, to get whatever you want to hear or see uh, and uh, be isolated from other opinions. So actually, I think that... Um, the solution uh, for, for the EU, and I know it's a very unpopular opinion, I think it's more free speech than less. And um, when, if Russia remains in one piece, I think one of, the main, uh, uh, one of the main first steps of the hopefully new democratic government, which I will not see in my lifetime, uh, will be to adopt a, a Russian version of the First Amendment. I think actually no one, invented, no one invented better protection for free speech than uh, the founding fathers of the United States. Well, on that somewhat hopeful note, uh, we are out of time. Thank you very much, all of you, for attending. Thank you, everybody to jo who joined in remotely. Sorry we couldn't get to all of your questions. Uh, thanks very much to our panel, Jessica Aro, Konstantin Egert, uh, Olga Rodenko, and Lukas uh, Ondekan. Thank you very much, all of you. Um, there will now be a short coffee break uh, before panels resume here at half past ten. So see you all then and thank you for coming.